Support for LAS comes from the LA84 Foundation, hosting the Play Equity Summit April 17th. Celebrate 40 years of impact and join the Play Equity movement to level the playing field for all kids to have access to sport and play. Register at LA84.org. I'm Julia Paskin. Join me as I talk with NPR's Sarah McCammon about her new book, The Exvangelicals, Loving, Living, and Leaving the White Evangelical Church. That's April 25th at the Crawford. Tickets at las.com slash events. LAS Studios. Hello, LA. Let's go see some movies. I'm Brian De Los Santos, and this is How to LA. Did you know that LA doesn't really have a major film festival? Not like Fantastic Fest or Sundance or Telluride. Our guests today are trying to change that. Sarah Winshaw and Micah Gottlieb are the founders of the brand new LA Festival of Movies. Opening night is tomorrow, and there's a lot of talk about some of the titles they're screening. The opening night film is the Sundance hit, I Saw the TV Glow, a supernatural horror film written and directed by Jane Schoenbrunn. Tickets for that film are unfortunately already sold out, but there are tickets still available for other movies and events. Those films will be showing around LA in Eagle Rock, Chinatown, and historic Filipino town until April 7th. And the best part? Individual tickets to screenings are just $20, a steal by most film festival standards. Hey, Sarah and Micah. So we're only a few days away from the festival itself. How are y'all feeling? Excited. I'm very excited. <laughs> you have excited. to say a little bit more excited than that. <laughs> um, I keep getting uh, colleagues and friends saying, oh, wait, that's already now? And I'm like, yeah, I know. I feel the same way. But I think it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, we're definitely flying by the seat of our pants, but, uh, you know, this is the first time either of us has run a film festival, but we've been really heartened by the positive feedback we've been getting and just the amount of interest has been really gratifying. L.A. doesn't really have a one all-defining film festival. The L.A. Film Fest is no longer, but the city's been host to plenty of them, you know, from Outfest to the Hollywood Black Film Festival to ones in downtown L.A. and Beverly Hills. What kind of sets yours apart? I think that for us, we really wanted, we really felt that there was a need for a festival that was exclusively devoted to new independent films and restorations that would happen at, at this time of year in the spring. You know, we're following a lot of the other major international film festivals like Sundance, South by Southwest, Berlin. And we felt that you know, some of the films that we read about and became interested in don't always make it to Los Angeles, or if they do, we might miss the week run or miss the single screening that's happening. And so we felt like there was really an opening. I would add that um, this festival, unlike many other ones in LA, which are really focused on, like, giving filmmakers an opportunity to learn more about how to get things made or how to get financing or, you know, more about like the sort of how to of filmmaking, which I know a lot of the wonderful festivals that already exist in L.A. focus on, that we're really trying to shift our focus to more of a film series that is hoping to pull in more people who are interested in watching films with a critical or cinephilic eye than uh, trying to serve the robust filmmaking community, specifically in L.A. You know, wh where would you say this idea came from and having it here in Los Angeles, like you just mentioned? Well, I'm from Los Angeles. I grew up here. I went to the movies almost every week with my parents. Uh, we used to frequent the Lemley on Sunset 5, which uh, is now the landmark on Sunset. Uh, and I was exposed to a huge variety of art house and independent films from all over the world growing up. And I felt that, you know, in Los Angeles, there's many great theaters, um, but sometimes it's, you know, it's easy to lose 
the the scope of it, given how big the city is, how many venues there are. Um, you know, there isn't always a lot of local press around alternative and independent film screenings. You know, after quarantine, you've seen all these new venues open up, like Vidiot's, like 2020 Arts and Archives. American Cinematheque taking over the Los Feliz 3 has been incredible. So, and there's many more, too many to name. And I think that it's just, it's really feels like LA has a better than ever film going scene. I have to travel for work as an independent film producer most of the time. And I most historically have always traveled to other film festivals to show my work. So it's really nice to be able to stay home and to offer other people like me the opportunity to show their uh, hometown audiences films. So this festival is also unique in that, you know, we, we weren't open to submissions this time around. You know, we had a huge list of movies that we wanted to see and wanted to consider for this and to make sure that all of them were things that were premiering in the city for the first time. And I feel really happy about the lineup that we've put together. I feel like it's very eclectic. So the lineup is 12 movies that are mostly new film premieres. We have three restorations. A lot of them, some of them are films that premiered at the latest edition of Sundance. We have uh, films that premiered at Rotterdam. And we have one world premiere, which is the new film by Connor O'Malley and Danny Scherer called Rap World, which we're really excited about. For us, you know, we kind of, we weren't interested in satisfying one particular genre or style of, of film. You know, both Sarah and I uh, have really kind of eclectic tastes. You know, for us, it was important to, if not have something for everyone, at least to have something that, you know, to sort of sh showcase the variety of things that we're interested in, whether it's, you know, French independent cinema from the 80s or, uh, you know, first person documentary filmmaking or kind of uh, low-budget comedies. We really just wanted to showcase the films that we felt were taking risks and that were really bold uh, in their self-expression. I haven't been to a film festival like Sundance or anything like that. So describe it to me. How? What's the vibe? What are people getting? You know, we're doing our opening night and our closing night at Vidiot's. And then the majority of the screenings and our two talks are taking place at 2220 Arts and Archives, which has a great lobby with a little bar. So, you know, what we hope someone might do is get a few tickets to a couple of movies all in a row, come out to 2220, spend a long time in the movies, hang out in the bar, talk about it with their friends, maybe hit one of our late night hangs, parties that we're planning. The point for this is really like it's an opportunity for people to come out, hang out, talk, watch movies, um, and feel like they're, you know, seeing other people that are excited about the same things they are. I think I would add to that, I think that some of our favorite film festivals that we've been to have a kind of regional or village feel where you feel like you can easily hop from one venue to the next. You can go get a cup of coffee, maybe run into somebody who you just met. That's something that we're hoping to convey, you know, by having our festival at these three venues that are all within, you know, four, four or five mile radius of each other, no more than kind of a 15 minute drive away. And as we bring up other film festivals, it's very different from Sundance. You need passes and you need some type of like money to go to these film festivals. Here it seems like you're trying to give it more access to different types of folks, not just maybe industry folks. Um, you know, why was accessibility to these movies so important to y'all? I think that right now I can speak as a film producer where there's a lot of conversation happening in the independent film industry about you know, waning appetites for indie movies or something like that. My experience is that that's not the case. And so I'm hoping that what we're doing here will kind of tell a story that is maybe at odds with the normal narrative that people have about independent film. And, um, you know, all kinds of people are going to be showing up. And that accessibility that you mentioned, we don't, we're not just showing movies to the people that make these movies and all kinds of people want to watch them. And I think that's kind of good for everyone to know that. Yeah, I think that for us, it was important to have a film festival that was somewhat free of the 
usual distractions of industry film festivals. I think that, you know, obviously it's no secret that Los Angeles is where the commercial film industry resides. It's Hollywood. It's a big part of this town. You also have the art world of Los Angeles, uh, which is also booming. But those two things are often quite separate or segregated. And so I think that one thing that we're hoping to convey is that, you know, cinema is a hybrid medium and it can, you know, intersect with a lot of other vital artistic practices and forms. For example, you know, we have two talks that we're featuring at the festival. One is with the musician Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth and the novelist Rachel Kushner in conversation about their relationships as artists to the city of L.A. and also their favorite L.A. movies. As we were talking about, uh, you know, the, the festival, we saw the list of your screening venues and really interesting spots like Vidiots, 2220 that you mentioned, now Instant Image in Chinatown. Why did you choose these particular theaters? We've been going to those venues as audience members. So that was one of the first things we thought about was where do we like to go? The other thing about it is that we're really excited about the programming they're doing. And geographically, you know, there's sort of a nice little triangle that they form um, that feels very accessible. Um, so that, to me, was were the main three things I was thinking about. So what about tickets? Because I, I, you just mentioned some of them are already sold out. Tell me, how's it going? We weren't planning on selling out like this. We're very, very happy and very, very moved and overwhelmed. So thanks, everybody who has bought their tickets already. And there are several screenings that are still not sold out um, that are really, really excellent, and a couple of talks as well. There's also an amazing movie called Malcaridas that I think uh, still has tickets, and it's a pretty special film where they smuggled cell phone cameras into a women's prison, and um, these inmates have kind of created the footage from the inside themselves, and it's pretty incredible. There are t- still tickets on sale for a new restoration of a film called Naked Axe by Bridget Davis. It's a black independent film from the mid-90s that was just restored by Milestone Films. This movie is uh, just a really amazing movie about um, kind of the creative class of New York City in the mid-90s. It's um, about a woman's attempt to be an actress while kind of reflecting on the uh, past generations of her own family of actresses. Now you want to be an actress. I am already an actress. If you just have to be in front of the camera, then then, then be a talk show hostess like, like, like Oprah. Do something like that. You know, you are the one who raised me up in every ratty little studio in the city. I sat in screening rooms the way other kids sit in daycare centers. And it's really funny, very true to life. And it's very cool that the filmmaker is coming in person to have a QA and a after the film with Maya Cade, who started the Black Film Archive, also an incredible initiative. You know, particularly excited about a film called Good One by India Donaldson, which had its uh, world premiere at Sundance a few months ago. And extremely excited to have the director and the lead actress, Lily Colias, there in person. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're excited about all of these films, and we definitely encourage people to come wait and stand by. You know, we do have reserve available, and, um, you know, you won't regret stopping by 2020 Arts when all of this excitement is happening. We'll be right back after this break. Imagine if you could charge your electric vehicle at the places you already love to eat, shop, and play. Whether you're at the movies, on your weekly grocery trip, or running errands at your local mall, Volta EV charging stations are built around your day-to-day and located in your community and nationwide. All you have to do is check in, plug in, and go about your day. It's EV charging made convenient. Download the Volta app to find your new favorite place to charge. You're going to debut the festival soon. What have you learned from the experience so far? I've learned that uh, there's really an audience out there for this. And I've learned how hard it is to put on a film festival very quickly. Um, We staffed up like a little over a month ago. And we have a very small, dedicated team of volunteers and a few staff members that have been working tirelessly alongside us um, that are just like incredible and 
we wouldn't be able to do it without them. I felt like I knew some of the challenges going in, but um, you know, pulling off an event like this with 12 screenings in such a packed period of time was a really awesome challenge. And I think that you know we'll be able to also say what we've learned once it's all over uh, with more confidence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd love to do it again next year. And it'll be fun to see what we would want to change, what we'd want to keep the same and everything like that. But one, one thing at a time. Uh, so we've been running this series on How to LA called Revival House, where we dig into the history and the present story of these indie movie theaters throughout LA. And we've learned that there's this huge appetite for rep films in these spaces. Uh, we have our theories as to why that is, but what do you guys think is going on here? Well, I think part of it is that, you know, obviously we went through a pandemic. It was a time when everybody was stuck at home, realized just how many options they had at their disposal to stream at home. And that's what people, you know, were forced to do. And I think that now that we're, you know, out of that period, we are still, you know, have a lot of, we still have the same amount of options of things to watch at home. But I think that there is a real hunger, um, especially, you know, among younger people to want to go out and discover things that they didn't know about before and also to do it in the company of other folks. And I think that, you know, that coupled with just the amount of, new venues and initiatives that have come about in LA, you know, whether it's the Academy Museum, the Vista Theater, um, Secret Movie Club, 2220 Arts, the list goes on. It's gone to the point where there's something worth seeing every night of the week. There is a great film playing every night of the week in LA, and it really was not that way uh, as far back as I can remember growing up here. I think people have always loved old movies and like new movies, you know, people like movies and uh it's fun to see them in a theater with other people. It feels good to go see a movie that's good no matter what year it's from, and it feels good to leave the theater and talk to your friends about it afterwards. Before I let you go, what's your favorite place to see a movie in L.A., and why? I feel like I have different theaters that I like for different purposes. Hmm, explain. I went, like, I went to the Los Feels 3 the other night to see, like, a late, later night screening of something at the American Cinematheque with a friend, and it was raining, and it was kind of unexpectedly crowded, and then afterwards we walked across the street and got a tea and some pie, and it was like, oh, this is nice, this is L.A. There was, like, people out and about in the rain, it was very romantic and sweet, so that that's a really nice way to go to Los Feels 3, um... I really liked, and this theater doesn't show movies right now, unfortunately, but the Highland Theater on Figueroa. I love to go see a giant blockbuster there, get a huge popcorn, um, maybe smuggle in a beer. But uh, now it is not showing movies, so hopefully that changes soon. I recently went to see Love Streams at the Egyptian, which is one of my favorite movies. And uh, I just think that theater has been beautifully renovated. It's a great place to see old movies. I also caught Claire Denise Beautravail recently with a packed house. It was amazing to see that movie with a big crowd after having watched it uh, at home, you know, multiple times over the years. Um, I also, you know, want to give a shout out to the New Beverly, which for me is a place that I have a lot of personal memories from. You know, in high school, I would take the bus there to go see double features. And it's really incredible how, you know, even with the changes in ownership, you know, with Tarantino um, having taken it over, it really does remain kind of this mecca of uh, watching films on celluloid. See a few animated shorts and trailers on film and watch a double feature uh, with, with cheap popcorn. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm really just uh, happy that the new Beverly still exists. And I'm excited to go to the Vista and the Video Archives Theater more often in the future. Micah, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you, you so much. Nice to talk. That was Sarah Winshaw and Micah Gottlieb, founders of the LA Festival of Movies. While some of the screenings are sold out, there are still some tickets available online at lafestivalofmovies.org. And for those Revival House fans out there, we'll be back with new profiles next week including Brain Dead Studios in the old silent movie theater building on Fairfax. Hasta luego. This episode is produced by Victoria Alejandro. The rest of the How to Lay team is Monica Bushman, Megan Botel, Erica Washington, and Evan Jacoby. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford 
who believe that quality journalism makes LA a better place to live. Oscar Gomez was a rising star, a radio DJ and a Chicano student activist, until his sudden and mysterious death. His friends and family didn't have closure. And all that's public record, right? That I can request. Well, see, here's the problem. What are you guys looking into this for? A quest to get answers. Imperfect Paradise, The Forgotten Revolutionary. At las.com slash imperfectparadise or wherever you get your podcasts. 